Okay. Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube. My guest for this show is Matthew Dix. He's an American novelist, a storyteller, a columnist, a playwright, a blogger, and teacher. He's the creator and co-host of the weekly podcast, Speak Up Storytelling and Boy Vs. Girl. He blogs daily at matthewdicks.com. That's D-I-C-K-S.com, Matthew. And he has a new book out. It's his fourth book, first nonfiction book, Story Worthy. Engage, teach, persuade, and change your life through the power of storytelling. There it is. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I, I call the show The Bottom Up Show because I think we're in a transition from a top-down to a bottom-up culture back to the way we were before there was <laughs> oh that's a first for the show so who was that who gave you a kiss oh that was my daughter she needed Aww. one more kiss apparently <laughs> that was sweet i love it. uh so i think we're transitioning back to a more bottom-up culture and so i'm interested in all different angles of bottom up and uh I think story is very bottom up i think that story helped to evolve the way our brains work and I think that we sat around campfires and told each other about our hunting for the day and our gathering for the day. And that helped to, to create who we are. And I think our stories define our cultures and, and so many aspects of who we are. Uh, that's why uh, back in 2002, I organized a conference, StoryCon, Summit Meeting on the Art, Science, and Application of Story which was the first time that brought together all the different worlds of story, uh, not just screenwriters or novelists, but ministers and attorneys and neuroscientists and mythologists, because story is huge. Story is, I, I figured this out, and that's one of the reasons I put this, that meeting together, which I did for six years. Story is one of the biggest businesses in the world. When you think of story, you might think of movies or television or novels or newspapers or magazines, but it's also marketing. It's lawyers talking to juries, ministers talking to their congregations, psychologists helping people to redefine their stories that define their lives. Story is almost everywhere you look in, in, in being human. And so you say in your book, Story Worthy, Engage, Teach, Persuade, and Change Your Life Through the Power of Storytelling, that the, the, the least reason for reading this book and learning about story is to get up and talk to a group in front of people. Right. That's true. I, I think that fundamentally most of our stories are told one to one or one to three. You know, I think we tell stories throughout our day and the best storytellers are our best communicators. So even if you don't want to take a stage, telling a good story can really be an asset in your life. And you are a consultant now. You teach storytelling to people who are never going to get up on stage. Yes, very true. Um, you know, the strangest reasons people take storytelling workshops with me now and um, take consulting with me, you know, first dates, for example, people who um, they realize that the things they say on a first date can't get them a second date. So they come and they learn how to tell stories. I get grandparents who can't get their grandchildren to listen to them. You know, I get uh, teachers who want their students to listen to them and ministers and priests and rabbis and everyone, museum docents who want to tell better stories about the stuff that they're, you know, pointing out to people in their museums. It really, every kind of person, every stripe comes through my workshops. That's really cool. So I've got a whole, I've got three pages of questions. I doubt we'll get through all of them, but you, you talk about storytelling as being a superhero and it being yes. a superpower. I do. I think that, um, I do. I think it's a superpower when you can tell a story that captivates and entertains and educates. I just think it's a lost art in today's world. I think there's a lot of really terrible storytellers in the world. And I think we encounter them on a daily basis. And when you can uh, communicate and persuade and entertain, I just think that is something that most people are incapable of doing. So if you hone that craft and you you become proficient at it and you become known as one of those great storytellers in people's lives. I do believe it becomes a superpower. I believe that you can do things that other people can't do. I think, you, you know, you might throw some of the most power pe 
powerful people in the history of humanity into that boat, this, and the stories about them, uh, like Muhammad and Jesus, what have you. And yeah. Abraham. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. I think, um, I think it's been proven time and time again that the most effective communicators tend to be the people who have the most power and the most influence in this world. Uh, you know, I've done, you know, I, I did that conference uh, and I've done consulting on story over the years. I've worked with politicians. It ends up politicians have to give a pitch. They have to give a stump speech. And very often it's two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. They're, they're getting up in front of a, a local crowd along with a whole bunch of other politicians. And they have to convince people to care about them. And yeah, people- I work. Yes, I work with politicians as well. And, um, uh, you know, I'm often just trying to find ways for them to connect to their constituencies, you know, to tell stories that will mean something to the people they're speaking to. And what I feel is that if politicians just talk about their issues, they're talking to people's heads. But if they can find a way to connect and get them to, and touch people's hearts, then they're going to reach at a much deeper, more powerful full level. And I think that's what you talk about extensively. It's almost your whole book is about becoming vulnerable, opening up and reaching out to people in that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I, you know, I often say that you really can't hate a person once you know their story. You can still fundamentally disagree with them. You know, you really can stand opposed to everything that they stand behind. But once you know their story, it's really hard to sort of see them as someone other. You know, as soon as they become vulnerable and you, they make a connection to you and you discover that they're, they're not very different than who you are, uh, you know, then ground is made and, you know, you come a little bit closer together and you may never agree on issues, but you can at least have a conversation. And I think in today's world, especially, we're not having a lot of conversations with the other side of the aisle. I think we're, we're yelling at each other and not looking to bridge that gap. I had to write that down. You really can't hate a person once you know their story. I agree. It's such, these are such tough times when it comes to that. It's so easy to be angry at and hate other people. And when you do know their stories, it makes such a difference. Yeah. So what is a story? You can, well, dif- can you differentiate between personal narratives and fictional or fairy tales? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, when I'm talking about story, I write fiction, I write novels, but the storytelling that my book deals with is sort of the personal narrative, stories about your life, true stories um, from, from your life, the things that you've done. I think that the mistake people make when it comes to what is a story is so often people think that a story is stuff that happened to me. And I'm going to tell you about that stuff in the order that it happened. You know, the classic example is the vacation story. Someone gets back from Bermuda and says, let me tell you about my vacation. You know, it turns out no one's actually wanted to hear the next sentence of that story, right? Nobody really cares about your trip to Bermuda. But, you know, if something happens on that trip, then you might have a story. So I tell people that stories are moments of realization or transformation. You either change in some fundamental way. Um, It can be an infinitesimal change, but it has to be some kind of a change. Or you've had a realization, you see the world in a new way, you see yourself in a new way, you've discovered something about a person who you've known all your life, something in your mind has changed to cause you to think in a new way. And if you get those moments, that's what a story really is. That's what every movie and every book essentially is as well. It's not some stuff happened, but something happened to a human being and as a result, they fundamentally changed by the end of the story. Now, here we are. We're 10 minutes into this interview, and you haven't told a story yet. Can you tell <laughs> your, your Benji story? Oh, which one? There's many Benji uh, stories. The one in the rain. Oh, Benji in the rain, sure. So, Well, Benji's one of my best friends and my oldest friend, so I have a lot of stories about him. Uh, Benji and I were living together when I was right out of high school. I got kicked out of my home, and so I moved in with Benji, who was going to college, and you know, he was a good friend back then. He was my best friend sort of coming out of high school. But he had a problem. He he held grudges in a way I had never seen a human being hold a grudge before. So if if you wronged him in any way, he never let it go. And so we lived together. He would make lists of our friends and he would rate the friends according to how angry he was with them. And, you know, it created a lot of problems for me and for our friends. And I I had this feeling right around, you know, I was 19 or 20 years old that I love this guy. 
I want to be his friend forever, but it might not work out. I don't know if I can be friends with someone who sort of holds grudges in the way that he does. And then one day or one night, really, it came to a head and uh, there was a big fight in the living room, a bunch of our friends and me and Benji. And Benji ran out the door into a rainstorm, which was really astounding. He can't swim and he's afraid of water. Like he's afraid so much of water that he can't go in the rain without a hat on to keep the water out of his eyes. But on this night, into the pouring rain without a hat on, he goes running. And today he runs marathons, but back then he had never run anywhere in his life. So he storms out of the house and runs off into the rain. And we expect him to be back five seconds later because we know who he is, but he doesn't come back. And so eventually we all sort of settle back down onto the couch. We're watching The Simpsons. And um, it's, it's about half an hour that he's gone. And when he comes back, the door flies open. He's dripping wet. He's like soaked to the skin and he's breathing heavily. And I don't know, he has a look on his face. I know that something has happened. And then he walks up to me and he kisses me on the lips, like a big, wet, disgusting kiss on the lips. And then he turns to my friend Pat, who's sitting next to me, our buddy, and he kisses Pat on the lips. And then he goes for the third guy on the couch, but now like we figured out that something's going on here. So the third guy manages to escape. But essentially what happened was on that run, he let go of all the grudges that he had been building up over the years. Something happened fundamentally inside him that allowed him to find forgiveness for all the things and all the wrongs and all the transgressions that he had been holding on to. He became a different human being that night. It was a really important moment for him because he becomes a different person, but an important moment for me too. It's a moment where I realize I think I can be this guy's friend now. Like Benji's gonna be in my life for the, forever now because he's gone off on a run and found something in the middle of the night, in the middle of the rain. And I don't know what it is, but it's changed the way we're going to be forever. So yeah, it was a it was a good moment for me and a good moment for him. Now you use that story, you, you, you use that story to set up some of your chapters in the book too. I do. I you know, I told that story to Benji. Um, I had told it on a stage and I said, I told the story about you running in the rain. And he said, but that's my story. How did you tell my story? And so I explained to him how stories are sort of like diamonds. They have like multi-facets. You can come at them from different angles. And if you can find your own angle to a story, if you can take someone else's story, but make it about you, talk about how it impacted you, then you can tell that story. And so I told him how I made it about me. And when I finished, he said, that's really clever. He said, you should put that in that book you're writing. And so I did. Um, but yeah, it's the idea that you really want to tell your own story. Telling someone else's story doesn't have the vulnerability or authenticity or honesty that's required. It's easy to tell the story of someone else. Um, but I can tell the story of someone else, like Benji's run in the rain, if it's a story really about me and something fundamentally you know, important to me that's going to shift over time. And that's what happens in that story. That's great. Yeah, so the rule is you don't tell other people's stories, but you can tell stories about other people in terms of how they're related to you. Yes, and sometimes that isn't the case. You know, I work with uh, the children of Holocaust survivors, for example, and uh, they often want to tell the story of their parents' experience in the Holocaust. And I tell them, no, I say, don't do that. I say, you're, that's the story of someone else. You're really just telling the story of a historical figure at that point. So I teach them instead to tell their own story but embedded within their own story is the story of part of their parents' experience during the Holocaust. It's essentially, how did your parents' experience during the Holocaust shape your life and change the person that you are? And then it becomes about that person, and then it's a better story. You talk a lot about homework for life. Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, homework for life. So. So at that point, when I started Homework for Life, I had been telling stories for a few years on stages, and I discovered that I was sort of running out of stories, that my list of possible stories that I could tell was shrinking, and I was getting a little nervous that I was going to run out of material. And so I gave myself this homework assignment. I said to myself, at the end of every day, before I go to sleep, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to ask myself, what is the most story-worthy moment of my day? What is the moment from this day that makes it different than any other day. Even if the moment that I'm choosing is completely not story worthy in any way, if it's boring, if it's not even a story I would tell my wife, whatever it is, I'm still going to find it. 
and then I'm going to write it down. Now, I don't write the whole story down because I just think that's too much. I like, I like strategies that are short and easily repeatable. And so using a spreadsheet, uh, I have two columns in my spreadsheet. I have the date on one side, and then I stretch that B column, that second column across the screen. And in that second column, I write down the story, which is to say I capture as much of that moment as I need to so that I will always remember it. My goal was to find maybe one or two stories every six months, you know, that I could add to my list. But what happened was really remarkable. Through the process of constantly reflecting on my day and asking myself, what's the moment that meant something to you? I discovered that our lives are filled with these moments. Like they are remarkably filled with moments of realization or transformation almost every day. I had no idea that this was true. And now, Thousands of people do this homework assignment with me. They've taken on the homework that I've started doing, and they can attest to the same fact, that your lives are filled with stories. And we either don't see them because we're not looking for them, we haven't developed a lens for storytelling yet, or tragically, we see them, we take note of them, and then we throw, away, throw them away like trash. Like we don't take a, the opportunity to record them, to reflect upon them, to maybe turn them into a story, but at least write them down because really powerful and important things happen to us all the time. And even when we see them, we forget them within a year. I, I and, love this. I, yeah. And I, and I must tell you that I started doing workshops over 30 years ago. I think in 1985 about, I called them positivity training workshops, even though the attendees, mostly psychologists and therapists would end up calling them smile workshops. And it came out of my discovery that if people think about heartwarming experiences, people that, that warm their heart, give them a glow, all their physiology would go in the right direction. Their heart rate would calm down, their muscles would relax. So I started having people in these groups share them. And uh, it, it, I realized that it wasn't just heartwarming experiences, it was positive experiences. And so I got into that and I put together a, a kind of a, a list of a whole bunch of different kinds of positive experiences. I call it the positive experience inventory. And it's been downloaded from my website tens of thousands of times now in, in, in Spanish and in English. Somebody translated it into Spanish. And really, what you're doing, is, I, I love it because they're all stories. When somebody writes down a heart warmer or a positive experience, it's the same kind of thing. And what I, what I would encourage people was that if you tell other people it, you're going you're gonna to feel it inside. It right. makes you feel good just to share it. So you're making a science of making story out of it, which is just beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. You know, the one thing I'll say is, I also encourage people to tell the stories that aren't as easy to tell. You know, people have told me to, that what I do is sort of like a gratitude journal. And I say no, because some days there's frankly just nothing to be grateful for. We have days where like to find something that's grateful for like the air or the sun or the green grass, that's, that's fairly meaningless in terms of like what's in our heart. And so I don't shy away from telling those other moments, sort of the like, the terrible moments too, they often make the list as well. And a lot of times what I've discovered is that I'm in the middle of stories, that I have a bad day, you know, but I discover that that bad day is actually linked because I'm capturing all these days. It's linked to a series of days that will ultimately result in something beautiful, you know, but oftentimes we have a bad day and we see it as a bad day. By doing homework for life, I just discover these chains of causality where eventually that bad day leads me to something that I would have never seen had I not been doing my homework for life. Now, you talk in doing homework for life of identifying stories that are story worthy, which is the title of your book, Story yes. Worthy. So what makes a story or an experience story worthy? I mean, essentially, I think that anything that involves that transformation or realization is is story worthy. It's not going to, it might not be the best story in the world, but it's going to be worth talking about. You know, after that, I think that the thing that stories really need are stakes, which is sort of the idea that something is um, at peril. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, peril like I'm about to fall off a mountain. It can be peril like my son has said something to me that causes me to wonder if I'm being a good father. 
Now you talk about stakes and you have five different elements in stakes. I'm going to do a brief station ID and then let's talk about those. Okay. I had it scheduled for later in the interview, but this is great. So this is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and at opednews.com slash podcasts. And uh, my guest for this show is, is Matthew Dix. He is an American novelist, storyteller, columnist, playwright, blogger, and teacher. He's also um, multi-award winning on The Moth as a storyteller. I left that out in the beginning, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he, ha he blogs daily and at, at MatthewDix.com. He's got a new book out, Story Worthy. Worthy. Engage, teach, persuade, and change your life through the power of storytelling. So you have five different elements that have to be in, that, that can be involved in stakes. Yes, they don't all have to be there. In fact, only one of them really needs to be there. Um, you know, it's what I call an elephant. It's essentially, it's the idea that every story should start with an idea of something that the audience needs to be concerned about, worried about, wondering about. You know, quite often people start telling stories and we have the thought of where is this going? or why is this person telling me this? When, when you have that thought, what's really happened is the storyteller hasn't given you anything to wonder about. I call it an elephant because it's like, so, so it should be so large and apparent that everyone in the room knows what it is. It's the idea that when you go to the movies, you never sort of walk into a movie and not know what you're getting into, right? You know if it's a romantic comedy, you know if it's an action adventure, you know if it's a spy thriller. You, it's very rare that you would walk into a movie, sit down and say, hey, I wonder what I'm about to see. We always have a sense of what we're about to see. But with stories, it doesn't work that way. Because if I tell you, let me tell you a story, you really have no idea like what the territory is about to be. Am I going to tell you a horror story? Am I going to tell you a story about when I was seven years old? Am I going to tell you a story about how I met my wife? And so an elephant is the idea that in the first 30 seconds of a story, you'd better give me something to wonder about, to hold my attention. Now, uh, it, you use as the example for this discussion of stakes, the charity thief story. Yes. Can you tell can us that? Tell you the charity thief story? Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, um, yeah, okay. Um, well, I'll tell you an abbreviated version because, you know, it's like a seven minute story, I think, in its full version. But... Um, Essentially, it's 1991 and I'm 20 years old and um, I'm driving home from New Hampshire one day and uh, I'm coming home from a, a sort of a, a date with a girl. And as I'm driving down the highway, I'm about 100 miles from my home, my right front tire blows out. And I pull my car over to the side of the road and there's no cell phones because it's 1991. Uh, and I haven't seen a car in a long time on this stretch of highway that I'm on, and I don't have a spare tire because I'm an idiot. I'm 20 years old and I'm driving around without a spare. And so I do the only thing I can think of doing. I hike back up the highway to see if I can find someone to help me. And so like six or seven hours later, I'm back at the car with a spare tire. I've given all of the money I have in my pockets over to this half-naked mountain man named Winston who owns Winston's Garage. He's taken all my money and given me this balding spare tire. But now I'm back on the road. I'm heading home, uh, 100 miles from home. When I look down at my instrument panel, I see I have no gas, like almost no gas at all. And all of the money I have is in the hands of Winston, the half-naked mountain man. I don't have a credit card. I don't have a debit card. I don't even have a checking account at this point in my life. I've got nothing. And so, um, so I take the next exit I see. I roll into a sitco station. I'm feeling like as alone as I've ever felt in my life. I don't have parents at this point in my life. My mom is living on welfare. I haven't seen my father in a decade. My brother and sister are sort of often lost to me. I have no answer. I have nobody. I have nobody in my life except for Benji, uh, but he's off in some college retreat. I can't get in touch with him. There's no cell phones, you know, I, I just, there's no way to get in touch with him. And so I decide I'm going to beg for gas. I'm going to go in the sitco station. I'm just going to, ask whoever's behind the counter for gas. I'm going to offer my wallet with my license in it, all of the luggage in the back seat of my car in exchange for about eight bucks worth of gas because it's 85 cents a gallon in 1991. So $8 is enough to get me home. And so I prepare this sort of pitch, like what I'm going to say to whoever's inside the sitco station. I prepare my story. 
I go in, there's a kid behind the counter just about my age. I tell him my situation, I give him my story. I ask for the gas and he says, no. You know, he says, I'm gonna lose my job if I give away gas, I can't do it. So I head back to my car. I figure I'm just gonna sit in my car and I'm gonna wait for that kid to go home and for the next person to come on duty. And I'll beg that person for gas and I'll just keep begging for gas until they finally give it to me. But as I get into my car, I see my crumpled McDonald's uniform. I'm a McDonald's manager at the time. It's in the back seat. And I suddenly have an idea. So like half an hour later, I'm knocking on this door. There's a little blue door in this little brick house on this residential street about half a mile down the road. And um, when the door opens, there's a man there. He's this older guy. Uh, you know, he's the kind of guy that looks like this guy knows everything in the world. Like, you know, I've got an uncle like this, you know, this uncle knows everything and this guy knows everything. And I know he's a, he knows that I'm about to do a terrible thing. Like I just know it in my heart that he sees right through me. But I'm at this point I'm wearing my McDonald's uniform and I'm knocking on his door and it's a Sunday afternoon. There's sort of like no explanation for me being here other than my plan. So I decide to go ahead with my plan and I say to him, hi, I'm Matt. I'm collecting money for Ronald McDonald Children's Charities. And uh, he doesn't move at first. Like he's like frozen in time, like waiting for me to arrive on this day. And then I say to him, and it's not even planned, I say, my mom is dying of cancer. My mom died of cancer when I was a little boy and my sister's dying of cancer. And I'm just trying to do whatever I can to help. And uh, he, he points at me and he says, don't you move. He goes back into his house and I figure he's going to a, call the police. He's going to arrest me for stealing money from McDonald's, which will happen actually two years later that I will be arrested for stealing money from McDonald's, but not on this day. Cause when he comes back on this day, he gives me $20. He's got $20 in his hand. I can't believe it. And so I say, no, that's too much. And he says, no, he tells me his wife, Lisa died of cancer five years before. And he tells me his two kids live on the West coast and they came back for the funeral, but they haven't been back since. And then he talks to me about the last year of Lisa, Lisa's life and how awful it was, how he wishes he could have told her to stop fighting, but he couldn't let her go. And then I'm sitting on the porch and I'm talking to this guy and he's telling me about his life and I feel like the worst human being on the planet. And then when he's done, he pushes the money into my hand, which is like poison to me now. And I go back to my car at Sitco and I use his money to put gas in my car. And, uh, and I drive away, I head home, 100 miles from home, and as I'm driving, I realize how stupid I am. Because when I was in the car earlier, I was feeling all alone, you know, no mother, no father, no siblings, no one to help me. But now driving back to Massachusetts, I realize I know nothing about loneliness. When I get home, it's actually Sunday night, I'm gonna be watching The Simpsons again, right, with Benji and Pat and all my buddies. We're all gonna drink beer and laugh and have fun. I'm not alone. You know, that guy behind me in that little brick house with the blue door, he understood loneliness. I knew nothing about loneliness. All I knew was I never wanted to know about loneliness in the way he knew about it on that day and every day thereafter. So that is the story of the terrible thing that I did that day. You won uh, a moth contest with that, didn't you? I did, actually, yeah. I actually, I lost the first time I told that story in New York, and then I took it to Boston and I won it. Yes. Did you change it? I'm sorry? Did you tweak it and change it? I did. The, first, the truth of the story is, after, um, after I get back from, Matt, from New Hampshire, I feel terrible. I've stolen money from a person, you know? In truth, I've stolen money from three people. I take two of the houses out of that story. I actually take money from three different people in three different houses. Um, so when I get back to Massachusetts, I decide I'm gonna give the money back. Every time I'm a customer at McDonald's, I'm gonna put a dollar in the canister until I pay back the money that I've stolen. And I do that. I still feel terrible about it. Like if we're really being honest, I still feel terrible about it to this day. Oh, and add that to the story. I'm, I'm telling you how to tell a story, but that's- Yeah, no, it's not good. Well, what I do is it becomes a habit. I just start putting a dollar in the canister every time I'm there until one day my wife, like 15 years later, my wife says to me, why do you always put a dollar in the canister? And I tell her the story about, you know, the charity thief. And at that point, I've been keeping track. I've paid back $614. And she says to me, Matt, you can let it go. And I do. 
I let it go at 614. I don't, I told that version of the story in New York and I lost by like a 10th of a point. The founder of the moth, George Dawes Green was one of the judges that night. And after I told the story, including that ending, he chased me out onto the street and he told me, don't ever tell that ending again. He said, nobody wants redemption in stories. They want the clown. They want to hear your failures. They don't want to hear how you were the winner. They want to hear about what you learned or, you know, how you failed, you know, how you were the loser. And I agreed with him. I understood what he meant. Ah. I, I, I think stories are like coats. When I tell you a story, I put a coat on you. And the better the story, the harder it is to take off that coat. It lingers with you in the same way movies and books will linger with you. If I tell you I did a terrible thing, but then I fixed it, I more than made up for it, I think you can put that coat aside. You can say, all right, he did a bad thing, but it's all fixed. The universe is back in order. I get to move on with my life. But if I tell you I did a terrible thing and I leave that terrible thing out in the world, if I leave myself as sort of broken in some way, I think that coat lingers on you longer. I think the story stays in your heart longer. Wow, so it's like, like, com like comics ha are wounded. Yes, I, I mean, even my novels, I end my novels always 10 pages before the reader would want me to end the novel. And I get hundreds of emails from readers asking me what happened next in the book. I love that, because that means that my book is stuck in their heart. Like so much so that they had to go find my email address and write to me. My, one of my books is really popular in Mexico right now with teenage girls. I get letters or emails from teenage girls in Mexico who want to know what happened to fictional characters who never really existed from a 47 year old white man in America. Like that is a real coat that I've put on those Mexican teenage girls because they're still thinking about my story because I've given them something to wonder about at the end. I love that. What's the name of the book? Uh, that book is Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend. Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend. Yeah, that's the one that's popular in Mexico right now. Maybe. Apparently, I'm getting a lot of email about it. So you talk about the storytelling lens in terms of finding stories and seeing. The other thing you talk about is that stories are five seconds to tell. Well, what I say is that really, ultimately, they... They take five seconds to tell in terms of what they really mean. So the story that I just told you, Charity Thief, if I want to really tell you what it is, all I really fundamentally want to say to you is there was once a time when I thought I was alone and I understood loneliness. But one day I met a man who taught me I knew nothing about loneliness, except I never wanted to know about loneliness and the way he understood it on that day. That's all I'm really trying to say to you. I'm really just trying to say I was once one thing, but now I'm another. Now, if that's all I do, I don't get to write a book. I don't get to speak to you. I don't get to go on stages. That's not entertaining, engaging. But that's what I'm really trying to say. And if I keep that five-second moment, that singular moment of realization at the end of my story in mind, everything else that goes into the story has to serve that final moment. And that makes my, my, my process of creating a story a little easier because creating a story is really just about choice. You know, if you're telling a true story, you're laid, you have a bunch of facts in front of you, like the truth of the story, all of the things that happen. A storyteller just chooses which facts to tell, which ones to leave aside, and then decides what order to tell them in, and then how to tell them, what words to use. Those are all just choices. And so if I keep in mind what I'm trying to say, all those choices become a lot easier. And you, you, just, you get into, it's about moments of realization or transformation, and they are momentary. They just take a couple seconds, really. Yeah, I do believe they fundamentally, most of the time, those moments are almost instantaneous. And I, I found the same thing with, with uh, heart warmers and the positive experience, because I've collected at least a thousand of them over the years from different workshops that I've done. And they're, they're just a couple of moments. It's the moments... Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's actually neurophysiological because you're, you're releasing endorphins very often, the endogenous natural opiates that we have, and if it, they don't last that long. Right. They disperse, they get, they get absorbed. And so it's only a couple of moments, but those moments are spectacular. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it in terms of changing your mind, that's a moment of realization is really your mind has been changed in some way. 
we don't gradually change our mind. Things will lead to the point that we change our mind, but it's one moment you thought one thing and the next moment you thought the other. It was a process of getting to that spot, but the actual moment where you change your mind is instantaneous. You know, it's, oh, I think this now. It might have taken 10 years of accumulated data and experiences to result in the change, but the actual change is almost instantaneous. And if we keep that in mind and remind ourselves, that is the story we have to tell. I have to make people understand that moment with the greatest clarity possible. That's my goal. And you talk about surprise as an element. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the goal in storytelling really is to have the listener feel the same thing that I felt at the moment I experienced it. So surprise, for example, stories are filled with surprise. They're often the most fun parts of stories. You know, the, wow, I can't believe that happened. The goal though is to surprise your audience in the same way you were surprised, but people are often just, the problem is nobody preserves surprise. Everyone always wants to say the exciting thing first. And so what they do is they strip the surprise out of a story by not protecting it, by not trying to create the same surprise in the audience that they felt on that day that they're describing. I, I just, I think it's a really important part of storytelling. It's the most entertaining part. And fundamentally, no matter what the reason is you're telling a story, the first reason you should be telling it is to be entertaining. Which reminds me of one of the pieces of advice I got. Uh, I can't remember the guy's last name, Doug. He wrote a book called Never Be Boring Again. Uh, it, it, uh, he basically said, when you're telling a story, you're telling it about your experience. And yeah. you want to talk about it through your eyes, through your lens. And so uh, as you're telling the story, you can actually be showing your reactions to it as well. Right, absolutely. The best storytellers in the world sort of relive the moment as they're telling the moment. Right. And, um, you know, the storytellers, like for me, for me, I see the story. When I just told you that story of the charity thief, when the door opens and the man's standing there, I see him as clear as day. I'm looking at you and telling the story, but truly in my mind's eye, I see the man. And because I see the man and I remember the man, now I can react in front of you in the same way I reacted to the man that day. And that's a model of acting too. That's the Stanislavski model of acting where you go through the motions as though they're real. Yeah, I mean, yes. I, the only thing I always tell people is it should never really be planned. You know, you want it to be authentic. And so when I meet people who tell stories and they plan sort of like hand gestures and things, I say, no, 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 no. Like, you can't be vulnerable and also rehearsed, you know, or overly rehearsed. You can't be vulnerable and have planned, um, you know, movements and vo you can't do voices if you're being vulnerable, all those kinds of things. You know, I have a thing called the dinner test, which is essentially the story that you tell on stage or the story that the rabbi tells or the story that, you know, whoever it is on stage is telling. It should be a cousin to the story that you would tell at dinner that night. You know, it's going to be a little more formal on stage. It's going to be a little more practiced. You're not going to be interrupted when you're on stage. But it shouldn't be very different than the one you would tell at dinner. That, that's essentially what sh we should be doing when we're telling stories on stage. Now, you were, before we, you told this charity thief story, you were talking about the need for an elephant in a story. What's the elephant in the charity thief story? Well, it starts with, you know, it always, doesn't always have to be the real elephant. So I start with the idea that my tire has blown out and I have no money, right? So it starts with, your, I, I'm trying to create some wonder in your mind. The wonder is, how is Matt going to solve this problem? He's stuck 100 miles from home. He has no money and he has a blown out tire, right? So eventually I get the tire, but now I'm out of gas. There's a new elephant, right? Now I'm out of gas. I've given you a new thing to wonder about. I would say the real elephant in that story is the idea that I think I'm lonely, but I'm not. I have to go learn something about loneliness. That's what the story is really about. But this, that whole story, the way it is, I can't make the whole story about loneliness. That's not going to be very entertaining. And so it's just the idea at the beginning of the story, I got to give you something to wonder about, even if it's not what the story is actually about. So it's a blown tire. It's a kid without any money. It's a kid 100 miles from home. It's sort of an escape story. It's a how is he going to get out of New Hampshire? without any money and without any gas. 
So you have four other elements I'd like to talk about, but first a brief uh, I show ID. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, iTunes, Stitcher, at opednews.com slash podcasts. And my guest for this show is Matthew Dix. He is a phenomenal storyteller who has won many awards uh, at the Moth all over the country, and he's the author of a book, Storyworthy, Engage, Teach, Persuade, and Change Your Life Through the Power of Storytelling. And you basically say there are five elements of creating stakes in a story. The first one is the elephant. The next one is backpacks. Yes. So backpack is the idea that there are times in stories when we want to load our audience up with our own hopes and expectations. So that as the story moves forward, the audience gets to experience the same feelings we feel. In the story I told you about um, Charity Thief, I tell you about my plan to beg for gas before I go into the gas station and do it. I tell you I'm gonna give away my license and my wallet and all my luggage. I'm gonna prepare a story for the kid. I, I load you up with all my hopes and dreams, all my plans before we go into the gas station so that when the kid says no to me, you feel the same disappointment I feel. When I tell that story in workshops, I watch the people really carefully. Every time I say the kid says no, their shoulders sag, right? They're having an emotional response. Some, sometimes people even swear. They say like, oh, and they like swear at the kid or they make like, they get really upset at this kid that existed truly 25 years ago, right, in my past and yet they're upset. They're upset because I've loaded them up with the hopes and dreams that I have, and then they see that those hopes and dreams fail. It's the same thing if you've ever watched like a heist movie, like a bank robbing movie, or the Ocean's Eleven movies. They always tell you how they're gonna rob the casino before they rob the casino. And the reason they do that is so that when the plan starts to go awry, you feel the same concern, worry, fear, that the people in the movie feel. If you didn't know how the plan was supposed to go, you wouldn't know when it was falling apart. And you would have no opportunity to be worried. You wouldn't think, oh no, if that doesn't happen, then this won't happen. That's why we have to sometimes load our audience up with our hopes and dreams. Usually when the plan is not gonna go right, when we're gonna have some disappointment, that's the best time to sort of put a backpack on an audience. It causes them to want to hear the next sentence. That's the goal of stakes, is to keep people listening. And what about breadcrumbs? So breadcrumbs is the idea that um, sometimes we lay a little hint at something that is to come. In the story I just told you, um, Charity Thief, it's when I look into the back seat of my car and I see that McDonald's uniform and I suddenly have a plan. I don't tell you what the plan is. That's going to create a lot of wonder in your mind. In workshops, sometimes I actually stop that story right there and I say, what do you think I'm going to do? The answers are crazy. People say, I thought you were going to go work at McDonald's for a little while. And I say, sure, that's how McDonald's work. You get to put a uniform on, walk into a random store, work whatever you want, get paid in cash, right? It makes no sense, but I've got them wondering. I've got them predicting about what might happen. As long as they're wondering and predicting, they wanna hear my story. They, they're still invested in my story. It's all about keeping people wanting to hear the next sentence of your story. Hourglasses. So hourglass is one of those things that, you know, the sand timer, you flip it over. I use an hourglass in stories when I've reached a point that I know the audience is dying to hear the next sentence. Like we've reached the moment that we've all been waiting for. And when I feel that moment coming, I slow everything down. I want to make them wait as long as possible to hear that moment. So I'll do things like overly describe something that does not need to be overly described. I'll start speaking slower. I'll start summarizing. I'll do everything I can to not say the thing that they want to hear the most. And that builds stakes, that builds suspense, that causes them to want to continue to hear the next sentence. I love it. And crystal balls? And so crystal balls are when we make a prediction on behalf of our audience. We say what we think is going to happen. It can never really be the real thing, and it has to be reasonable. And the story I just told you, it's when I tell you um, the man goes back in his house and I know what he's going to do. He's going to call the police and they're going to come and arrest me for stealing money from McDonald's. I make a prediction. And because I make the prediction, 
the audience must find out if the prediction is going to happen. That's just the way human beings are. We're prediction machines. We just look for patterns and we try to predict based upon patterns. So when I vocalize a prediction in my story, it causes the audience to want to hold on and find out if that prediction will come true. And you also, you said an hourglass going once you said he walked away from the door too, so. Yeah, that's true actually, that's a good point. You know, no one's ever said that to me, but that is true, I also slow it down there because you don't know what he's coming back with. Yeah, good point. And the last one is humor. Right, so humor I don't believe is really a steak, but it can sort of substitute for a steak. It's the idea that sometimes in stories, we have a section that we have to get through that we know is not very entertaining, but it has to be said. And if I can't sort of punch it up with some stakes, I'll punch it up with humor because humor will keep people listening at least for a while. A funny story will keep people on the hook for a while. And so I'll use humor strategically in moments when I know my story might be dragging a little bit to keep people's interest. Okay. That said though, I'll tell you, you don't have to be a funny person to tell a story. You know, I know some tragically unfunny people who tell fantastic stories. Now, the story arc is an essential part, and you've already kind of talked about it a little bit, but talk about the story arc and how that fits in with telling your personal story. I think it's the most important thing, actually. I say if you get the arc right, you're going to be better than 90% of the people telling stories today uh, in any format. Essentially what it means is we've got to find a frame for our story, a beginning and an end. If you find a good beginning and an end, you're, you're, you're really in good shape. The end of the story is always going to be that five second moment, that moment of realization or transformation. It's the moment I discover I know nothing about loneliness. You know, that's the end of my story. The five second moment, that, mo that important moment we're aiming at, always has to come at the end of the story because it's the most important thing we're going to say. After that, people stop listening. It's why after the Death Star blows up in Star Wars, we get one scene where Two people get a, 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 an award, you know, and Chewbacca doesn't, and we'll never know why, and that's it, the movie's over. We don't go into like, well, does this mean the Rebel Alliance has a firm footing? Does this mean the Empire is reeling? You know, what about Darth Vader? He flew off into, none of that is important. The Death Star blew up. That's the most important thing, end of movie. And so the same thing in stories. They have to, when you reach that moment, that critical moment, you must end your story as quickly as possible. I'll throw in that there's a neurobiology to that. There's that short, evanescent time when your endorphins kick in at that touching moment, and yep. they don't last that long, so you don't want to try to push it. <laughs> right, you don't. You, you've probably been in situations, though, where people just keep talking, and you think, are they ever going to stop talking, right? Because it's, it's just getting less and less interesting the more they talk. So you yeah. find that moment, that's the end of your story. And the beginning of your story is simply the opposite of the end or an approximation of the opposite of the end. So if at the end of my story, I discover I don't know anything about loneliness, somewhere in the beginning of my story, I have to say, I know something about loneliness. And I do at the beginning of the story, I'm parked at the sicko station and I'm thinking I'm all alone. I got no parents, I got no siblings, I got no aunts and uncles. I'm stuck here in Connecticut, I'm stuck here in New Hampshire with no one to help me. I'm all alone. And at the end of the story, I realized I'm not alone. I got friends. I drink beer and watch The Simpsons with those guys. I got a great life. That's essentially how that frame is going to work or that arc. So if Talk you get a little bit more about the beginning and how you take the beginning from those, the, the, that magic moment at the end. Uh, I'm sorry, what do you mean? Well, you just kind of walk through that. You, you, you basically I was, said you, you, you use the end to identify your beginning, but can you give an example, like let's say from a movie? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, movies are really good at this. Um, uh, if we talk about Star Wars, actually, for example, for a moment, if you think about those characters, there's a bunch of them in the movie. If you think about Luke Skywalker, for example, at the end of the movie, he turns off his targeting computer and uses the force to destroy the Death Star. So he believes in the force. At the beginning of the movie, if you pay attention, Luke does not believe in the force. Luke doesn't know anything about the force and kind of thinks it's mumbo jumbo. It's the story of a boy who sort of finds his destiny and finds faith in something he can't see. So at the end, he can win. Han Solo is the same way though. Han Solo at the beginning of the movie is a guy who will only do good things if people pay him money for it. And at the end of the movie, 
he arrives at the nick of time and risks his life to save his buddy and destroy the Death Star. He has a transformation as well. He goes from scoundrel to, you know, hero over the course of time. So actually, if we're thinking of Harrison Ford, my favorite example is Raiders of the Lost Ark. People often think that that's just a movie about Nazis and snakes and, you know, gunfights, but really it's actually the story about a man who finds belief in God. If you think about the movie, at the beginning of the movie, the government comes to, to Indiana Jones and says, the Nazis are looking for the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, which holds the Holy Grail. Why are they looking for it? And Indy says, it's said that an army that carries the Ark of the Covenant in front of it cannot be defeated, but it's just mumbo jumbo, it's hocus pocus, it's nonsense. Indy doesn't believe in God, he's a scientist. He doesn't believe in any power of the Holy Grail whatsoever. And so he spends the entire movie hunting this thing down just because he's an archeologist and he wants it. At the end of the movie, he's tied to a stake with the woman he loves, Marion, and they're about to open the Ark of the Covenant for the first time. He's finally going to see what's inside. He's wanted to see all his life. And what does he tell Marion to do? He says, close your eyes, Marion. And he closes his eyes. And because they close their eyes, they're the only two people on that little island who survive all the Nazis faces melt with that terrible like you know cgi that spielberg is stuck with at that moment he did, believes in the power of the ark of the covenant he believes in god at the end of the movie he goes from a man who doesn't believe in god in the beginning to one who does at the end spielberg is smart though he knows to keep your attention to keep you watching this i'm going to put in nazis and i'm going to put in snakes and i'm going to put in whips and truck races and gunfights and all of this business but fundamentally, it's going to be a story about a man finding faith in God. So you're doing your homework for life, writing down these five-second moments of, of intuition, of, of, of awareness, or transformation, or realization. Yep. You're going to take that moment of realization or transformation, then you're going to do the opposite of it at the beginning, and you're going to put in the middle of it aspects that got you there. Right, exactly. That's your, your formula for a story, basically. It is. And I often say the beginning and the end are the most important. I think of it as, fly, as being, on, being in a plane. If the pilot gets you off the ground safely and lands the plane safely, that's great. You're willing to forgive turbulence along the way. You know? And, that, and I think the same thing with stories. If you find the right place to begin to launch your story and you find the right place to end, people will forgive a rough middle as long as they feel good about the beginning and the end. So find the right beginning and in the end, you're better than most people because most people don't tell stories that way. Most people just say stuff that happened to them in the order that it happened. Now, and those aren't stories. One of my favorite aspects of the world of story is the, the hero's journey. Campbell's model of it or the monomyth that came before Campbell. Yeah. Uh, where does that, I mean, and George Lucas literally hung out with Joseph Campbell as he was doing his movie series of Star Wars. Right. So what's your take on the hero's journey and where does it fit into telling personal stories? I think that sometimes it works great because sometimes we are on a hero's journey, you know, where um, we're on our path to discovering things. I think when it comes to personal stories, we have to be really careful. I don't think we get to destroy Death Stars in personal stories. People really are not interested in your success stories. They really, they, they don't want to hear about your amazing, fantastic, you know, remarkable achievement. That's not very entertaining for people. It doesn't make them feel good. Uh, people like to hear about failure. People like to hear about embarrassment. People like to hear about the lesser moments of our lives. Even if we're telling a success story, people believe in small steps and not enormous leaps. And so even if I'm telling a story about a moment of success for myself, I will often not tell the whole story. I'll tell a bit of it. If I was going to tell the story, for example, of publishing my first novel, I wouldn't tell the story all the way to the I moment that I that story. Uh, of publishing my novel? You're yeah, I mean, you know, hearing from your agent. Oh yeah, that was fantastic, right. But that's probably what I would do. I would end with the phone call from my agent that said, I think we have someone interested in your book. And I'd end it right there. I wouldn't take you to the process of like seeing it in the bookstore one day. 
because I think people understand promising phone calls more than they understand someday seeing your book on a bookshelf. I like to leave, I, I like to leave my full success off and just take a tiny step. I think people appreciate that. They connect with it more. They understand it more. Actually, the part I liked was you got the phone call that there was a contract and then you were running around the school. Right. I turned that story into really not a story about publishing my book, but the, the need for me to tell my wife the good news before anyone else. It's really a story about a man's love for a woman and what that means. It means that sometimes our most joyous moments must be shared with the person we love the most first. Yeah, and really so rather than, right, rather than being success about publishing a book, which most people will never understand, they do understand the idea of, oh yeah, sometimes you just want the right person to know first. That touched my heart. That was yeah. nice. And, and you write about bringing tears to people. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, you know, oftentimes when people are teary-eyed at one of my stories, it's because at the moment that I'm describing, I was also teary-eyed at that moment in some way. You know, maybe I wasn't crying, but I felt it in my heart. And that's what they're doing, too, is they're feeling it in their hearts. And you talk about that being related to surprise. Yeah, well, I believe that the only way you can create an emotional response in a story is through surprise. In real life, I could like, I could harass you for months and eventually I could cause you to break, you know? Um, but in stories, we don't, I don't get to badger you for months. I don't get to harass you or do things over a long period of time. I've only got a few minutes to tell my story. So I, have, I believe I have to surprise you in order to provoke that response. A laugh, for example, is nothing but a surprise. It's the light in the phrasing of words or an observation that you've never sort of had yourself. So every laugh is a surprise. I believe every tear in a story is a surprise. It's a moment when you were thinking one thing and suddenly your heart was touched and you're thinking something else and that provokes the, the cry. So another reason why surprise is so important, it really is the only way to provoke these large emotional responses from people. Now, you've talked about how stories are these little moments but you also talk about how big stories are much harder to do and not, not to be encouraged as much. Right. Well, I, um, I tell people, don't tell your big stories at first because they're much harder to tell. I, I went into storytelling because my friends told me uh, that I was going to be a great storyteller because I've lived the worst life of anyone they knew, they said. Uh, and that's not true. I've worked with I know people who have had much tougher lives than myself but I've led one of these unusual lives. I've twice in my life, uh, paramedics have brought me back from, from death, from not breathing and my heart not beating. And I was homeless for a period in my life and I was arrested and tried for a crime I didn't commit. And like, that's just the tip of the iceberg of nonsense that has been my life. And so my friend said, go to the moth and tell those stories, you're gonna be amazing. And I believed it at first. But what I discovered was, it's really hard to connect to people on sort of a going through the windshield and dying on the side of the road level, right? People haven't experienced that. And so they don't really feel it in the same way I felt it that day. And so I say, tell your small stories, tell little moments because those people understand. And if you're gonna tell your big stories like the time I died or the other time I died, you can't make the story about the big thing because the big thing is not understandable. Instead, you have to make the story about something small within the big story. You have to include the arc and how it changed you or how you became a, a, aware or something. Right, and so like I tell a story about the time I, when I was 17 and I was in a car accident and I go through the windshield and I ultimately die and am brought back to life by paramedics. But the story isn't about that at all. It's actually a story about how my parents don't show up in the emergency room because they're just not effective parents. But my friends instead find out what have hap what's happened and they show up in the emergency room for me. They surprise me in the emergency room. And they're standing there in the doorway chanting my name as I'm rolled down into surgery that day. And so it's not a story about a car accident at all. In fact, I get emails about that story all the time. No one's ever emailed me and said, I love the story about the time you died or the time you went through a windshield. It's always, I love the story about the time your friend showed up in the emergency room. In fact, when I tell that story, People cry, they weep when my friends show up in the emergency room. It's just a beautiful moment. It's one of the most important moments of my life. 
They never cry when I die in that story. When I go through the windshield, they just continue to blink at me. And then I say, you know, I died. And they just, they just nod. And nobody cries when I die because nobody can ever connect with that. No one can ever really understand it. I can't make people understand that. But I can make them understand what it's like to be left alone. How to, what it's like to be let down by your parents. What it's like to be picked up by people in an unexpected moment and to be surprised by friends. Everyone understands that. And we've got a wrap. We've hit our time limit here. It's been, it's a, been a pleasure. Time. Thanks so much. You've been listening to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, and my guest for this show is Matthew Dix. He is the author of Storyworthy, and his website is matthewdix.com. Thanks so much, Matthew. Thank you very much.